It is a pleasure uh, for us to host uh, our dear partners from um, uh, different European countries. Um, this panel is hosting uh, other beneficiary organizations like our observatory. And uh, we have also the pleasure to have with us uh, Gilles Pelayo from the uh, Education and Culture Executive Agency, which is the, the organization managing the funds, the European funds for remembrance projects. Um, as uh, Jordi, our director, just mentioned, the observatory was funded under the umbrella of the University of Barcelona Solidarity Foundation already 10 years ago. So, um, with the support of the European Commission, uh, we started with an action grant in 2012, and then we, we got the, the support of an operating grant. 10 years, time flies. In 10 years, things have changed quite a lot in the sphere of the European Union remembrance policies. In fact, our first project was titled for a, for a European democratic memory beyond Nazism and Stalinism. Why? In that moment, most of the projects that were accepted by the European Commission were devoted to address the topics of Nazism and Stalinism, its causes and consequences. But very poorly, other kinds of projects were accepted in that time. So what happened? What happened with other memories? As previously the director said, we should be, um, uh, we should get um, used to talk in plural, memories, not memory. So what happened with the troubles in Northern Ireland, for instance? What happened with the civil war in Greece? What happened with the Spanish war? These were memories that were not taken seriously in that time. So together with other partners, when we started our proposal, uh, we can say we, we, we got some attention from other partners from different countries, also interested in getting representation in this European uh, arena. Um, one of our funding pillars was, since the very beginning, to get the visibility of these multiple memories existing in all member states. Um, that's why we started with this uh, network uh, with a few partners, and today we are proud to say that we have 53 partners from more than 20 countries. And together with them, we try to analyze the different policies that are developed all around Europe, but also the conflicts. As we normally say, memory is normally conflict. With the enlargement of the European Union in, two, in 204 and then 207, the new member states brought new points of view about memory and remembrance. We are all um, aware of this. New partners from Eastern countries brought uh, new ideas and new opinions on remembrance in the EU. Clearly, uh, communism doesn't mean the same in certain Central or Eastern European countries that suffer harsh repression and the totalitarian regimes. It doesn't mean the same that in other Western countries of Europe, where um, communist militancy, let's say, were very important for the resistance against uh, Nazism, occupation, against fascism, dictatorships. So we should put the balance on these memories, which is far from easy, and we should analyze with the help of our network what kind of remembrance policies are being developed in Europe. Um, quickly, from Europe, uh, we try to put our, um, our contribution on this analysis. And we can say that today, the new CERB program, Citizens, Equality, Rights and Values, embrace all these uh, sensibilities. We feel comfortable now developing certain activities, certain programs that are touching, as it was previously said, memories connected to present issues, but also looking to the future through historical knowledge. Um, today's racism has its roots in the past, in colonial history, in slavery, which Europe was completely uh, in a position 
of power in that, in that time. LGBTI rights also should be addressed through memory. Gender equality, the role of women in the past. Now we are always talking on this, but 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it wasn't so uh, a broad idea. So we feel comfortable with the new program, developing all these activities and promoting projects connecting today's issues with the past, as I said. Also, we, we are happy to, to work with uh, a European uh, youth audience. It's, we normally say that it's difficult to find young people in our activities. It's only the, the experts, the veterans associations, memorial associations, and, and, and freak people like us, but it's hard to, f to find uh, young people. So we are also devoted to, to try to, to solve this together with our colleagues. They can also tell you about different programs involving young people in different European countries. So, well, this is uh, the short presentation of our observatory in the frame of the SERP program. And it is a pleasure to give the floor to Gilles Pelayo, who can uh, give us a broad idea of what this uh, new project uh, program uh, means. Gilles, please. Many thanks, Oriol, and uh, really a big, a big thank you to, to Rome for uh, hosting this event, organizing this event. It's a really a real pleasure to be here for this uh, 10th anniversary uh, and, uh, and fifth edition of uh, Taking Stock uh, say conferences, and at last, let's say in person, to be able to, to be here in, uh, in beautiful uh, Barcelona. I've got an easy task. Uh, uh, this, evening, this evening, because Ana Gallego, my, my boss, has already set the scene of the, the policy uh, priorities, and I believe the important thing would be to leave the floor to, uh, to the projects, let's say, to, to the thing that, that we support, because uh, we don't do anything ourselves in the uh, European Commission services. We just have the, the privilege of, um, of lending support to, uh, to uh, beautiful projects such as on, uh, on European uh, Remembrance. I will just very quickly, and uh, uh, in front of a floor of distinguished uh, historians, take the risk of doing a very short history of, uh, of what we've been doing um, at the European level, supporting, uh, supporting let's say, uh, projects on, um, on memory policies, on remembrance, and on, uh, on history. Uh, indeed, uh, remembrance, uh, memory, uh, memory policy has been part of uh, the EU policy agenda, uh, let's say, for over 15 years now. It's relatively recent when you look at uh, what, the, what the Union has been doing. There are some, some progress much more, uh, and some policies much more ancient than that, but let's say it took, it took that much in the history of, uh, of the European Union to, to get to the point where the need was felt to, uh, to do this. And as much as Spain has perhaps uh, forged or developed the, the concept of uh, memoria democratica, it's very true too that the uh, EU work on memory has been since the beginning anchored and clearly framed as part of its policies um, of citizenship, let's say. That's, that's where it started. Uh, and that's a way of acknowledging what has already been said, uh, that is the, the vital link between uh, history, remembrance, and related policies, and the health of our uh, democracies. And this started in particular at the beginning of the year 2000, uh, that, that's quite recent, with the, the creation of the Europe for Citizens uh, program uh, that started officially in 2007, uh, as, as the case that, you know, contemporaneous to, to, the Spanish, uh, to the Spanish law, I just realized this, including a specific remembrance dimension in, the, uh, in this Europe for Citizens program. So, so a very, uh, very visible illustration of this link uh, between democracy and, uh, and memories. This program then developed, you know, I will make the, the story uh, very short, uh, continued. Um, the, the last uh, such program on Europe for Citizens was uh, from 2014 to 20, 
and we've been you know, blessed to give you an idea of supporting 286 projects during that time, during those seven years, for a total amount of uh, 27 million euros, uh, roughly. So taking, taking shape and, and growing. Initially, as you said, Oriol, perhaps the scope was rather uh, limited. Uh, limited, but you know, important and, and a very wide subject, uh, certainly, because we, we focused initially on issues related to totalitarian regimes and their consequences, including you know, genocides and the Holocaust and European construction. Now, um, we, are, we have a new, a new program that incorporates uh, these, uh, these issues, these policies. You, you mentioned it, Oriol, it's the uh, Citizens' Equality, Rights and Values uh, program. Good news is that uh, our uh, political masters at the European level and indeed budget masters to the European Parliament and the uh, EU Council uh, have understood the growing importance of, uh, of those issues in, um, in the world today and in Europe today, uh, really. And so uh, they have given more importance to, uh, to this program and just, just basically increased the, uh, the budget. So we have started to, to implement this new program, the Citizens' Equality uh, Rights and Values program, and uh, already, you know, in 21, 22, the budgets have been increasing, four and a half million in 21 this year. We will have spent on remembrance projects um, 7 million uh, uh, euros. Uh, in 21-22, we stayed uh, focused on, uh, let's say, traditional areas of activities, I would say, such as the um, uh, commemoration of and research and education about crimes uh, committed under a totalitarian regime, and also the second emphasis more on democracy, resistance, democratic transition, and democratic consolidation in the EU. But as hinted by uh, Anne Gallego in the um, years and months to come, the scope of, um, of our activities and uh, the scope of the projects we are going to support will be, um, will be enlarged. Uh, just to, uh, let's say, elaborate a bit uh, on what she said, we will have a, a first priority uh, still on democratic transition uh, rebuilding and strengthening societies based on the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. And that is where a special emphasis will be put in our calls for proposal, in, uh, in our programming on victims. So uh, uh, that's a kind of uh, signal to all those participating to, to, those, uh, to the work of this, uh, of this conference that there will be a space in the near future in our calls for proposals for this dimension of the, of the victim. This will be um, let's say underline explicitly uh, underline, and we uh, we we expect good projects on this. We will continue uh, to, and that's the the second priority to to be uh, working on uh, on strengthening the the remembrance of the Holocaust, genocides, war crimes, and crimes against humanity to to reinforce democracy of the EU, which means that we you know we don't abandon those traditional uh, priorities. We we continue. The third priority uh, will indeed be, as Anna Gallego said, migration, decolonization, and multicultural European society. So that's, that's a real novelty for, for our program. That's a, a sort of leap, quantum leap in other, uh, in other, on other issues. And uh, we will be uh, ready to support in this framework uh, projects uh, working around the, the legacy of colonialism inside and outside Europe and its uh, impact on, on contemporary uh, uh, European society. So that's, uh, that's a new dimension. With, let's say, more margin for maneuver in the budget, we'll be doing uh, more of this. And, and finally, uh, the fourth priority will be uh, European integration in, and its defining achievement to, to work a bit more on the uh, Europe itself, the European project itself. Johan has been, for instance, commemorating the uh, anniversary of the Vento 10 manifesto. Uh, let's say uh, su such actions are, are important because our European Union is still uh, in a, by historical standards in its infancy, I would say, or perhaps teenage years, so it's important to, 
to, to make uh, European citizens uh, aware of, um, of this. Uh, final words, uh, just to, to explain to, uh, to all who are not uh, familiar with this, the program is directly managed by the European Commission, which means it's not, let's say, decentralized to national or uh, European uh, or local authorities, sorry. And it's, it's been, uh, let's say, uh, given for management to, uh, to the agency that I represent, the uh, Education and Culture Executive Agencies. And we do this hand in hand uh, with the colleagues uh, of the Directorate General for Justice, which is, uh, let's say, primarily uh, responsible for the program. That is why you have heard um, Anna Gallego, the Director General for, for Justice. Uh, in this context, you know, I'm, uh, I thank you. I'm really glad to, to open this event. Uh, glad to, to, to be part of a very European uh, panel because we, it is our firm belief that uh, transnational approaches to, um, to memories, to, uh, to history are really fruitful in the national context as much as they are uh, useful in the uh, international uh, one. I'm really uh, looking forward to our conversations on the, the so important topic of the victims and related uh, legislations. And thank you very much, Oriel. Thank you. <laughs>
topics of memory in these places, uh, in places like uh, the Germany House, where, of course, the soul of Europe is present, is all around you, where memory is all around you. So the uh, particular importance uh, of the set, of the location. And this also, uh, so we, we have this idea to um, continue this uh, this uh, uh, this work of taking stock um, not only with uh, civil society but also with young uh, people and also in another uh, exceptional location which is Ventotene but after um, before sorry uh, to talk about this project more in detail so I'd, I'd like to spend two words on the Germany house the Germany house is located at 40 kilometers uh, from Paris uh, and uh, this was the, the house where Jean Monnet, the founding father of Europe, uh, had been living for, from uh, 1943, uh, 45 uh, to uh, 1979. After his death, the European Parliament decided to, to buy this house to make it a place of, uh, uh, of transmission of, uh, of the memory of this uh, um, great man um, and of course of the European history also to, to make it a, um, a common uh, European heritage, a, a place of the common European um, heritage. Starting from the 90s, uh, we hosted many, many hundreds uh, of, uh, of kids, of pupils, of classes uh, um, to whom we transmit, we, we accomplish, we, our mission to, to transmit the, the history of the Germany, uh, of, the, uh, of the European integration, and uh, um, of course of the milestones of, the, of this project of Union, which is the European project. From 2018, the uh, Germany House was uh, um, was uh, kind of uh, um, integrated in the House of European History. So uh, the Germany House became a service of this unit. And we de developed also trainings for uh, EP staff. Uh, EP staff uh, who spent uh, um, three days training uh, in the Germany House also so uh, deepened the subject, the, the topic of uh, the history of, uh, of the great man and the history of uh, European integration. So like uh, memory is uh, um, perceived something uh, important, fundamental, not only for uh, young generation, not only for uh, public in general, but also for the internal uh, staff of uh, European institutions. And finally, uh, it's not only the, uh, the house of, uh, of citizens, but also a place uh, hosting high level meetings. As you can see in the, uh, in the photos, so in uh, 2020, we hosted um, a high level meeting among the three presidents of the European Union. And the idea is really to um, allow also to this uh, high level meeting to, to um, enjoy, to really benefit the inspiring uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this place, where the, uh, again, the south of Europe, uh, when the people, visitors, and also these high level um, uh, guests uh, can feel the uh, and find the, the soul, uh, the soul of Europe. So, uh, coming back to to, to to the project of the of the school uh, for on, on memories, uh, the project is in collaboration not only with the RAM but also with the Instituto Spinelli. Uh, we started our collaboration uh in uh, um, 2020 with this uh, publication ventetene 80 for the anniversary for the 80th anniversary of the um of the manifesto we have the, the possibility to present this publication um in verona and in, Ven in ventotene for the federalist uh, um international seminar um last uh, last summer and here um, we had also the occasion to launch so the school to present this project of school uh, to uh, young people. So two main um, 
um, aspects that I like to underline about this project is a project that, of course, is uh, focused on memory, but not uh, only Yes, of course, we start from memory of uh, wars, but we really focus on the memory um, about solidarity, about reconstruction of the European project, about this new common history um, starting from the uh, 50s, so from uh, this uh, common project of European um, shared by all the European countries. And second element, of course, as uh, Oriol also um, underlined at the very beginning of this um, um, of, this, of his presentation, the, the, the audience. We really wanted to address the, uh, young people um, to uh, not limit this discussion about memory to um, institutional and academic um, levels, but also to spread among citizens um, to talk about memory, about the importance also for future, for present, to uh, to interpret it, uh, present through, through memory, also to younger generation, to citizens and to younger generation in particular. So my presentation is over. Thank you a lot. If you have any question, I remain available. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much for your presentation and for waiting till late. Um, then we will continue with uh, Almudena Cruz Yabar. So Almudena is the responsible, is the head of the support unit from the DG for Democratic Memory of the Spanish Secretary um, of Democratic Memory. So Almudena, it's a pleasure to have you on board tonight, and the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Oriol. Um, buenas noches a todos. Gracias por estar aquí. Thank you for being here. Congratulations, Eurom, for this tenth and ten years. I will try to be brief because we are behind schedule and uh, my train. Well, I'm going to miss the train. After 1945, this broken Europe realized that uh, in order to make the European territory more cohesive, it wasn't enough to create this economic cohesion. There was, well, something else was missing, and that's why the foreign affairs ministers of the Europe of the time in 1975 uh, signed uh, a declaration for European identity, which established uh, the basis for different actions, such as the group of intellectuals uh, that Romano probably put together to look at the in spiritual and cultural dimension of Europe. And I'm mentioning this because that's when the European identity was more closely linked to culture. And that's what I'm going to focus on. The Secretary of State talked about education. That's one of the main axes of the memory policy at this uh, Secretary of State. And the other uh, great basis is culture. In Europe, we've had different examples, especially as a response to crises such as the economic crisis of 2008, where projects such as the new narratives for Europe were implemented or the active European remembrance uh, were uh, devised that started to fund these projects that had to do with the memory of totalitarian regimes. More recently, we have the 2019 European Parliament resolution on the importance of memory for the future of Europe or the creation in 2021 of the Remembrance Group at the European Parliament. All this initiatives, in my opinion, respond to another kind of crisis, which is the refugees crisis, to appeal countries such as Germany, Austria, or Denmark, or the even Hungary, that after 56 was uh, split by Europe and relocalized in record time, and uh, we now we see how Hungary reacts. All these initiatives I would like to mention because 
we see that Europe ended up by establishing an ethical position against the war and in favor of democracy. And um, what Oriol said at the start, that's the feeling that we have, that was basically focused on Nazism and communism for obvious reasons, of course, but it's also true that there is a 2006 report of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe meeting in Paris that specifically condemned the violations during uh, the 1936 Spanish War and repression uh, after Franco came to power. So we were also placed in the map of this same, this very stage. Let's talk about memory through culture. Let's focus on culture as one of the tools for memory. This is translated into helping heritage speak. Uh, it's important to use historical heritage to link it to the legacy of our forebearers. However, uh, in German, in German, it's Eabe, and in English, it's heritage. You receive that. That's part of the concept. But for that object uh, to uh, remember that object, we need to add an action. Otherwise, they will be just mere stones. How do we manage that heritage? How do we research it? How do we preserve it? How do we place it on a list of special importance? How do we musealize it? How do we open it up to tourists? How do we make it visitable? That's how that heritage will validate certain ideological stances and even articulate a whole territory. So this heritage is extremely powerful and managing it will multiply its presence and will lead us to think not about one past, but about the past, which is the past that we see from today. It might be different tomorrow, but it's going to be the past we decide about. So the new Spanish law of democratic memory, I mentioned this report of uh, the Council of Europe from 2006 uh, condemning the violations of human rights in, in 1936 and uh, the repression after Franco's re during Franco's regime where there were forced disappearances, uh, extrajudiciary uh, killings, uh, concentration camp policies, forced war, labor, torture, and so on. And in the preamble of this new law, there is a mention of two important factors, uh, understanding the knowledge of uh, democratic uh, workings, and we will see how that is translated into acts, and then promoting and maintaining the memory of victims of the war and the dictatorship. It is necessary that citizens are aware of their own history to identify and uh, deactivate the uh, totalitarian um, leanings uh, within its own society. That's important. That's why education is so important. It is important to understand how we reach democracy in our country through the sacrifice of many men and women who contributed to that. And in that sense, uh, this law especially mentions four constitutions, uh, the 1812, 1869 constitutions. Uh, this is an important uh, fact to emphasize uh, this uh, 19th century because otherwise uh, we believe that everything uh, came about after 1945 and it's not the case and these places of memory these memory sites uh, intend to compile all these locations that started appearing in the 19th century and we have devoted an international conference in the Senate to the liberal triennium with an important publication there's going to be a large exhibition in the San Fernando Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Madrid which is related to this uh, liberal triennium and the other constitution the other constitution that is compiled there is the 1931 constitution we have had a big celebrations uh, for these constitutions and for some of the uh, main characters uh, such as Azaña president of the republic or Clara Campoamor as one of the drafters and defenders of uh, uh, feminine uh, voting rights in our country. And we have devoted an exhibition to Clara Campoamor and uh, 
and we've seen her statements in the Congress and so on. So, and the other constitution is the 1978 constitution. Uh, it will turn 45 years of age next year and with the Secretariat of State of Relationships with the Court, so we will have an artistic exhibition that has to do with all the rights that were conquered through the 1978 Spanish constitution. Looking at the European dimension, we're also celebrating all the achievements uh, across Europe, and we will hold an exhibition next year on the relevant women who have contributed to making up the Europe we uh, know of today, well, our current Europe. In this stage, prior to 1978, we cannot forget the exiles that have already been mentioned here today. We had a large exhibition in 2019 to uh, exiles, and there was another one in Malaga on the Desbanda. It was uh, one of these chapters, uh, it was similar to Guernica, but uh, a little bit earlier. And in that uh, link, linking up with Europe, uh, there is going to be, uh, in a few weeks' time, in Casa Separa, there's going to be an exhibition on the Mauthausen uh, meeting between Jews and Republicans uh, in exile. So there are different connections, and in terms of archives and uh, other levels, we're working closely with France and with Portugal. Regarding our major projects, we have the Documental Center for Memory. It was created in 2007. It was promoted by the Spanish law on democratic on historical memory. It, compi it compiles everything that has to do with main, the main characters, exiles, groups, and everything that was important. And, and it is uh, of free access, is uh, universally available. It includes all those documents that were classified before 1968. This new law is also creating the Center for Democratic Memory to promote memory, democratic values, uh, and human rights. And we also have uh, additional projects that uh, I don't have time to mention. It is important, though, to underline that underline that we are touching on many different aspects related to culture with the Cervantes Institute. We have a number of publications. There's one on Ramon uh, J. Sender. We're also supporting the cinema. And let me conclude by, in the same way as the Secretary of State, uh, about memory sites and the new law on democratic memory promotes uh, an inventory and compilation of uh, this historical site. It intends to uh, uh, raise awareness of these sites and uh, turn them into an international um, circuit. The Council of Europe has several examples of inter inter interesting networks, such as Atrium, with the architecture of totalitarian regimes, including Italy, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria. But I think this could also be uh, extended. We also have uh, the route for the liberation of Europe, as well as other routes. But it seems that the South, the South is not very organized for that. And I also like another German word for monument, Tenkma which means think. It is important because these sites need to make you think. And there's a great controversy because among the lists, important lists that raise uh, the profile uh, in uh, the UNESCO list uh, of uh, human sites, there's only two sites, Auschwitz and the Bikini Atoll. Uh, these are two very tough places, but they have been turned into World Heritage Sites. And this is a way to acknowledge that mankind has nice things, such as the pyramids in Egypt, although nobody tells you about how they were built, because that's less, less interesting. But it also has these other sites, which are also important. And there's a controversy, because these sites, the ICOM, which is uh, drafting the World Heritage List. It's not very clear about the indicators that need to be measured uh, to 
award this important uh, category that provides so much visibility to the site. And there is an ECOMOS report that has been commissioned for that. And uh, this report states uh, that this is not World Heritage. And we need to change the, the mindset for that, because these memory sites are also uh, World Heritage. They are essential for education. And I think that we all together, through these networks that we will hear about now and other international and European, European networks, we all need to make sure that culture is part of education and memory should be part of culture too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Almudena, so whenever you have to leave, just just leave. Work, remembrance, and solidarity with our dearest colleague uh, Rafael Rogulski. Nuestro querido colega Rafael Rogulski, que es el director de esta red, y tenemos el honor de colaborar con ellos desde hace ya muchos años. Y el año que viene probablemente organizaremos algo grande aquí en Barcelona junto contigo. Rafael, tienes la palabra. Thank you very much, Oriol. Thank you very much, um, Jordi. I would like to thank you also for giving me the chance not to see the first game of the of the Polish team uh, during the World Cup in Qatar, which ended uh, zero to zero. So it was not worth to to be seen. Thank you. <laughs> and now I will try to make you more familiar with the. European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, and with some of our project, especially those supported uh, through uh, through um, uh, European Commission. So the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity is an international entity uh, uh, supported the dialogue uh, about history of 20th century. Mm, uh, the members of the network are countries, uh, especially Poland, Germany, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. Those five countries are those who uh, financed the, uh, many of our activities, core activities of the of the network. But we have also. Mm, in our advisory assemblies, so-called um, um, observators, mem countries who, who have the status of the observator um, obs uh, 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 in the network, mm, and those are Austria, Czech Republic, Latvia, Albania, and Georgia. And our main aim is to be uh, a place for exchange between governmental, civil society, academic and research organizations active in the field of 20th century history and its commemoration. Uh, I'd like to underline also that ENRS is an international initiative that combines being a public and non-governmental entity. Mm, uh, we. Mm, organized starting at 2010, almost 200 projects delivered in 27 countries, mostly European countries. INRS is focused on research, documentation, especially on dissemination of knowledge about European 20th century history. Uh, develops its long-term activities in the five-year perspective, supported by the expertise and advice of its international advisory bodies. For the years 2021-2025, we have defined five thematic priorities on which the ENRS, ENRS action plan is based. So the solidarity and resistance against undemocratic and inhuman powers, uh, anti-Semitism, migrations, the end of the Cold War, and reconciliation. Our target groups are you, so the representatives of institutions and organ organizations dealing with the 20th century history, culture managers, academics, researchers, teachers, educators, students, and 
graduates, youth politicians and opinion leaders. Main activities are connected with delivering educational, academic and cultural projects, um, organizing conferences, symposia, seminars and workshops, publishing and translating works for academic as well as a general audience. Uh, Yenever's main partners uh, um, are institutions in all over Europe and also some uh, country behind uh, Europe. Uh, we have for almost 500 uh, partnerships uh, from um, almost 40 countries. And mm, those institutions are research and academic institutions, in the institutions for institutes of national remembrance, think tanks, archives, museums, memorials, culture centers, educational institutions, but also government and self-government administrations unit and diplomatic missions, consular offices and culture institutes. Um, INRS has a long time experience in implementing various EU and non-EU founded initiatives, including Europe for Citizens, three project grants, International Visegrad Fund, and various other international and national grants program. Uh, we are currently involved as a partner in a Horizon Europe project consortium. But the initiative with the most direct overlap with the mission and objectives of our organization in this year until 2027, probably also in the future, is certainly self program. Uh, in 2021, we successfully applied also for two types of grants. Operating grant for 2022 as a part of a four-year framework partnership agreement and uh, action grant in the field of European Remembrance for our Sound in the Silence project. Uh, self objectives uh, which include promoting citizens' engagement and participation in the democratic life um, in the Union and exchanges between citizens of different member states and rising awareness of their common European history are reflected in different ways in all of our projects. Moreover, we collaborate with other organizations with a similar profile operating internationally, like Eurom, for example, or uh, House of European History, or Platform of European Memory and Conscience. And with all those um, institutions, um, uh, in 2021, we organize a debate, remembrance in action within the framework of the conference on the future of Europe. Now give me a chance to uh, say something more to make you more familiar with some of our projects. The first is the European Remembrance Symposium, our annually uh, networking meeting is an example of project illustrating the specificity of our activities and their mm, alignment with the objectives and principles of SERF. It brings together organizations with a similar profile, operating nationally and internationally, giving space for exchange of ideas ex ex experiences uh, and giving also a chance for future cooperation between them. This year, for example, it was the anniversary event, 10th edition, took place in Trinity College in Dublin, aimed to discuss the meaning and role of reconciliation in the context of both historical and contemporary European internal and international conflicts. We had 35 panelists, roundtable and panel discussions, 
but also case studies presentation and, for example, turbo presentation. So you, we give one minute and a half for each speaker to present their own project, sometimes the institution. Mm, uh, we have also always time for culture visits, uh, especially in memory places, characteristic uh, for the place where we are. And as you may imagine, maybe the next location of the, uh, of the symposium will be Barcelona. And, and we are, uh, actually we are preparing now the next year symposium. So please feel being invited uh, to come back to Barcelona um, uh, between 10th and 12th of May is the plan. Is the plan, is the plan. Mm, but we will inform you via email about the exact date. But the main topic will be solidarity. We run also information campaigns. Mm, uh, the, the most important are those two, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, so 27th of January and remember August 23, the European Day of Remembrance for Victims of Totalitarian Regimes. Mm. And uh, self-founding allowed us to expand the scope and outreach of those campaigns. For example, we were able to produce more films about victims of the different totalitarianism, which we present Mm, on our web page, but also uh, especially mm, also in different televisions and through different institutions uh, mm, um, on these dates. And I'd like to present you 30 second film to give you view how it can uh, how, how, how it works, how we do this. It will be uh, about Doina Cornia, the Romanian human rights activi activist. It's not easy to admit that your world is not what it seems to be. That your reality is made of lies. It's a shock most people avoid. As humans, we prefer comfortable lies to difficult truths. But once we see them for what they are, there is no turning back. I looked at a photo of Ceausescu surrounded by people. He looked quite well, like a free man. But the others? Some of them were sitting with their hands crossed. Others were grasping pens or hiding behind notebooks. They had expressionless faces. Then I had my revelation. How on earth have even our features changed? It scared me. It really scared me. What is happening to us? What is happening to us, the Romanians? Corna was a Romanian human rights activist. Her letters to Radio Free Europe showed the world the complexity and tragic fate of living under a communist totalitarian regime. She was spied on and arrested, mocked and persecuted, but she remained true to herself, her family, her students, and her readers. Corna outlived the Romanian tyrant Ceausescu by 20 years, but she was free long before he died and his regime fell. She was free from the moment she saw the world as it truly was. Remember her. Uh, our strug struggling to remember victims of different totalitarian regimes. Uh, if you are interested in such films, they all are on our internet page and also uh, on our YouTube 
we can show you also another one, also 30 seconds. Mm, not so sad, maybe, for the evening. Oh, this is not this. Okay, so I'm sorry, we cannot do this now. Um, I wanted to show you a, a story of, of Jan Cross, um, um, an Estonian writer, uh, which is really powerful, but, th but we cannot do this now, so I'm sorry. But it is possible to see it on our website. Uh, another project, uh, Sound in the Silence, educational project um, prepared for um, people from, people from, young people from secondary school. It's an interdisciplinary remembrance project aimed at encouraging high school students to uh, critically reflect on different aspects of the 20th century history and their importance for today's Europe. Uh, through uh, non-formal learning methods and artistic means of expression. So we invite young people from four different countries. Mm, through the recruitment process, we look for teachers, mostly history, history teachers, who bring us these young people mm, to the memory place. So we invite them, for example, to former concentration camp like Gusen, Mauthausen, Gusen, Auschwitz. And those young people coming from different countries, having different base, uh, will be confronting uh, with the history of the place and then uh, prepare a presentation, theater presentation, performance together. Uh, um, um, through artistic workshops. They spent there at the place seven, eight days together. In this year, um, we, through the ground, thanks to the ground, ground um, uh, from the European Commission, we have the possibility to make no, uh, um, four editions instead of two in normal situation in Kaunas 9th Fourth Museum in Lithuania and Mauthausen Gusen Memorial site in Austria. And next year, House of Wannsee Conference in Germany and Jasenovets Memorial in Croatia. Um, so, and I, will, I would like to end with uh, some... One minute, okay. I can skip this because these are opportunities and challenges uh, for the SURF pro project. We can discuss this later. <laughs> two minutes. Okay. I'm sorry for making it too, so long. So, the first opportunity uh, which gives us the SURF program is a project and organization's expansion. Uh, if it is important for you as a commission, Mm, uh, to expand to, uh, to other institutions, to mm, be more visible. I think that it could be considered a quite high level of complexity, co complexity involved in managing and operating grant. All limits, requirements, uh, the need for time-consuming and in-depth legal and accounting consultations. Mm, it is usable and doable as, 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 we, as we do, but it, is, mm, it can be quite problematic for smaller institutions without mm, uh, so um, bigger possibilities like ours, for example. The second point, uh, benefits of cooperation with the other beneficiaries. This is, of course, a crucial point, uh, not only of um, uh, SURF program, but also of all of our institutions. But um, I have the feeling that there is not enough opportunities for uh, such a meeting uh, and workshops uh, uh, for the beneficiaries and the European Commission to exchange experiences and best practices in already running projects, uh, but also uh, new ideas and new partnerships. 
uh, there is a significant, significant potential for synergy, both as a progression from one program to the other, but also from mutually reinforcing each other while working in the same thematic areas. The point three, EU addressing the Russian invasion, invasion of Ukraine at various levels, including self-programming documents. Uh, uh, a crucial step considering how, how timely the issues of remembrance and history are these days, how important it is for understanding the complexity of the current political situation and its impli implications for our national and European identities. Mm. Our experience with partners from other non-EU countries, such as Georgia or Albania or Serbia, prove their importance and strong presence in the international dialogue on 20th century history and remembrance. Perhaps it would be worth considering increasing the eligibility of the activities for non-EU citizens run outside the EU, but of course clearly linked to program objectives and not violating any grant rules. Of course, apart from geographical restrictions, limiting, limiting the activities to implement only the EU in the EU. And last point, um, a strong emphasis on ongoing monitoring actions aimed at measuring uh, the impact for our project in both short and long term. This is a very important point also for us. Mm, but uh, the, the, mm, the main mm, uh, tool used by European Commission to measure the impact of the program is the Justice, Rights and Values Survey, which is more concentrated on those value than on the project itself and mm, actually not gives us uh, uh, direct, direct feedback mm, to the beneficiaries regarding the quality and effectiveness of our actions. It is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafal. Thank you for the presentation of your activities, but also for bringing on the table some important um, uh, issues, let's say, for beneficiary um, organizations. Um, well, now it's uh, finally. Thank you for waiting to Morgan and Zeli. Um, our colleagues from Memorial de la Shoah in Paris, Morgan Nepper and Zeli Dol, will explain a bit um, what they are doing from their organization. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, I'm, my name is Morgan Knepper. I work at the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris. So, I will be brief, uh, briefly um, presenting our institution for those who don't know us. And then we will have a focus on uh, our European training program and uh, on the, um, the work we do regarding a victims database. Um, so the, the origins of the memorial date back from uh, to the Second World War with the creation of a documentation center, a Centre de Documentation Juive Contemporaine in 1943. The idea was to already, during the war, uh, gather all the evidence of anti-Jewish persecution in order to bear witness and demand justice, de demand justice after the war. So this is what happened. Uh, actually, the docu uh, documents were, were used during uh, trials, remember trials, for example. So la later in the 50s, um, the documentation center participated in the building of a monument in Europe dedicated to the memory of the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust. Uh, and then the Memorial de la Shoah, as we know it today, was created in 2005. So um, on the forecourt of the, of the Memorial, you have a wall 
who um, while is erecting the names of uh, uh, 76,000 Jews deported from France from 92 to 1942 uh, to 1944. Uh, within the memorial, a uh, flame burns in memory of the victims in our crypt, and also outside outside the memorial, you, you will find a wall uh, of the righteous righteous among the nations. So name after those who risked their life to, to save Jews during the war. So this is, um, so the ma memorial is still today the leading information center on the subject in Europe and con continues to document uh, its document collection activity on a daily basis. But it's also now a museum hosting a permanent exhibition and also temporary exhibition each, each year, cultural events. Um, uh, it's still a archival center open to researchers, but also a place of remembrance where co commemoration take place uh, all year round. So it's a place dedicated to the transmission of memory. It, it offers educational activities for all ages and sensitivities. Um, so we uh, host many uh, schools uh, all year round. Uh, we have guided tours, uh, uh, workshops, uh, study trips, and um, we don't, uh, so we sh of course uh, share knowledge about the Holocaust, but also we uh, address issues like anti-Semitism, racism, um, conspiracy theories, uh, all kind of, of subjects. We uh, finally, we organize training for teachers and also for various uh, trades, like uh, for the police, for the judges, uh, for journalists, um, and many other um, uh, trades. Uh, we also have developed a citizenship course for perpetrators of racist, racist and anti-Semitic offenses in part partnership with the uh, Courts of Appeal. But the memorial is not only in Paris nowadays, it's also, it also opened a museum in 2005 in the suburb of Paris, in Drancy, where there used to uh, be uh, an inter internment camp. Uh, and also the memorial has entities all over France uh, in the French regions and a regional branch in Toulouse, which allows really us to work on the transmission of also uh, local histories and local memories. Uh, regarding our presence in Europe, uh, the, our European dimension has uh, really uh, grown over the last years. Uh, thanks to the support of the European Commission, which, uh, with whom we have a, a framework partnerships under the SERV program. Uh, we train teachers uh, in Europe and also students in over 20 countries. But my colleague Zeli will present this um, more in details. And we, ho we host also um, a cycle of trainings and summer schools for teachers in Poland, Germany, also in Israel. And uh, in memorial sites, uh, we have also a correspondent in Italy where we develop many activities, trainings, partner, um, partnerships, exhibitions. Um, and then uh, now I will leave my colleague Zeli present uh, our European uh, training project. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, can I share my screen? I don't think you can see it now. Well, I hope it's working. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to present our activities. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, everyone, for welcoming us. Uh, so I'm Zeli, and I'm working at the International Relation um, Department at Memorial de la Shoah. Um, I will try uh, to be brief. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce the Active Holocaust Legacy Program which includes actually two uh, main programs. So the first is uh, Holocaust uh, as a starting point, which is a um, teacher training. And the second one is called Never Again Really, which is aimed for students. So this is a, a student's training, a transnational student, uh, student training, sorry. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to answer the question why we created those two programs. 
So first, Holocaust is a European legacy and bound the countries together. Uh, we observe that Europe is facing actually several and simultaneous tension, social, economical, political, and now military threats. And two main observations now. Some tension are closely linked to the World War II. It's, uh, it's clear when uh, Putin says something like uh, uh, he's fighting back against neo-Nazi when he talks about Ukrainian people. But also, falsification of history is a new tool to challenge democracies, and we assisted in February to the military translation of this falsification of history. From that perspective, uh, we intended to shape this program to take the Holocaust as our common starting point to address current tensions for Europe, for relevant regional dialogues, and to tackle Holocaust and history distortion. I, I listed some few main goals we have in mind. So the first one, and the, maybe the most important one, is we are trying to build communities of teachers, of uh, coordinators, but also we intend to create communities of, um, of students since we, we are uh, creating this new program, Never Again Really. On the second hand, um, we, we aim to strengthen academic scientific knowledge and to put back scientific rational narratives into the broader historical and political debate by giving tools to the teacher and the student to face, uh, to face the threat of anti-Semitism, Holocaust distortion, pacification of history, conspiracy theories, and so on. Here you can see the several seminars uh, we will organize in 2023, helped by uh, the, the European Commission. So the first one uh, I talked to was uh, the Holocaust as a starting point. This is a teacher training. And I'd like to, um, to highlight that we never select uh, countries randomly. We actually intend to, uh, to gather countries which have all a common heritage in, term of, in terms of negative history. This would be the case of France and Germany, for instance. Or we will intend to gather countries having tension between each other due to a conflicting memory. So that would be the case of Greece and Bulgaria, but also with the program Never Again Really, with Romania and Hungary having this tension um, about this uh, Hungarian minorities in the Trianon treaties, for instance. Very briefly also, I'd like to, to show you how we, we, um, we uh, conceived the, 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 the program. So for the teacher, uh, we gather 50 teachers from two or three different countries, and uh, we offer a program made of a balance between historical lecture and pedagogical workshop. And finally, we also, we also want to introduce the local history through a, a site visit. For the Never Again Really program, it's slightly different. So we also aim to, to target 50 students from two different countries, in this case, Hungary and Romania. But this will be the, first, the very first edition in 2023. And we hope later on, if it's a success, to uh, develop more activity on the same, uh, on the same shape that Never Again Really. Uh, the program is also uh, different from the teacher training because it is it thought as an intellectual survival kit for understanding mass atrocities and genocide in its historical and legal dimension. And, and by, by that, we also intend to give like a, um, uh, the basic knowledge uh, of understanding uh, the geopolitics tension at the moment for future political leaders or future uh, uh, educational leaders. What are the goals for the stakeholders? We aim again, I insist on this, but we aim on creating a community of teachers and students among Europe to facilitate good practice, new transnational projects, and to strengthen scientific knowledge to fight back the falsification of history, and Semitism, Holocaust distortion, and conspiracy theories. And by that, we also aim to strengthen European values and to strengthen basic values of democracy.
a focus on the, the challenges. Um, we we uh, define three main challenges at the moment. Um, we think it's necessary to involve the EU candidate countries in our program because they are facing the same threats than the countries uh, part of the EU. And we're really concerned, as you could see, by history's pacification and think that it's, uh, it requests the greatest attention and mobilization of the remembrance stakeholders among Europe. And finally, we think like uh, we, we could be more efficient on the ground by by include, include a better inclusion of people in charge of the manual and curricula, because they have a, a, a more the hands of uh, the possibility uh, of on the curricula scholar. Sorry <laughs> for the confusion. And that's all for me. Thank you. I think uh, Morgan will uh, complete by presenting the victim database now. Thanks. C'est toi qui fais avancer le... Ou si tu veux, je te laisse oui. euh, reprendre la main. Tu préfères Non, vas-y, c'est pas grave. Ok. So, yeah, I wanted to, to talk briefly about the victims database, since this is a subject you will be discussing in the next days, and uh, we won't be present for the discussion. So, uh, we just give you an overview of what we do at the memorial, as an example. So, maybe uh, the next slide. So our, document, our, our documentation center um, has been working on the indexing of names since its creation. It was first a list, then it became a digital database. Uh, the objective wa was originally to help people be reinstated in their rights uh, and to obtain a compensation. But today, the, the documentation the documentation center manage, uh, manages a nominative database, which includes around uh, 99,000 names of victims and 180 names of what we call authorities, names who are mentioned in the documents. Uh, so you can um, uh, re search by name or by, by document using our doc documentary portal, uh, which will provide access to all the information on the per person uh, so this database is still updated uh, on a daily basis, uh, and we have maybe one specificity: is uh, the memorial is very transparent about what it published, and uh, all names must have several sources uh, to be uh, present in the database. We need to cross all our sources. Maybe uh, next slide, uh, Zeli. So uh, it's just to show you what it looks like, so you can search either per person or document and uh, then you will arrive if you take the example of Simon Veil, Simon Jacob, next slide. You can see that you have all the information on this person uh, when she was also um, deported, um, her ID, ID, identification and next slide. All the documents and mentions you will find in our archives, so in the films, photographs, documents, everything is uh, in the same um, on the same page, which is allows really researchers and but also families and all people coming to the memorial to do their research. Um, one challenge we have in France compared maybe to other countries is that the, the French law does not allow us to publish information on person uh, without uh, their consent. So some documents, if we have the consent, will be accessible online. Some other documents, we, you will have to come to the memorial to um, to look at them. Um, so yeah, that's it about uh, the database. Uh, I wanted just to conclude with our perspective regarding those topics we have uh, talked about regarding the database. Um, we have an exciting ongoing project, uh, creating a digital monument for which we screen um, the name of other vi victims, what we call the victims, which means uh, um, those who were, were not deported. Uh, so this, will, uh, this monument will be in our crypt. It's designed as a memory object, and it will be uh, directly linked to the, our database and will be automatically updated on a daily basis. Rega regarding our work on uh, remembrance, uh, we have also an exciting new project uh, creating this 
uh, European Network of Remembrance uh, Young Ambassadors. So just um, uh, witnesses are really part of um, 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 our work at the memorial was, uh, has relied a, lo a lot on uh, witnesses uh, and uh, survivors. And uh, at a time now where they, they are disappearing, uh, we need to rethink uh, and find other ways uh, to ensure that the, the history of the Holocaust is shared and remembered. And for that, we can also mobilize uh, our youth in Europe so, um, just to give you um, an overview, uh, the memorial has uh, been coordinating a network of ambassadors, a national network since 2015, um, which uh, with uh, the network brings together now 13 institutions uh, who, are, who are backed uh, with an, uh, by an historic site um and linked to the history and memory uh, of the holocaust uh, during world war ii so it aims to promote uh, knowledge and transmission of the history of the holocaust as at a national and also local level um, contributing to the affirmation of democratic democratic values and uh, particularly in the fight against all forms of racism and anti-semitism so the, the network relies uh, on young ambassadors, remember ambassadors, who are responsible for carrying out uh, the history and the mission of the place of remembrance they represent. So from next year, we will be uh, building on this uh, successful experience in France and initiate the development of um, similar, but much bigger <laughs> uh, network uh, in Europe. Um, so so, so that these young people will uh, be able to, to carry the memory, uh, this memory and the memory of these places they are linked to and be fully engaged in uh, the process of uh, reflection and uh, transmission also. So yeah, so that's it for me as well. Thank you, Morgan and Zali, for being reachable online. And uh, well, see you next time, maybe in Paris. So now the time, finally, thank you for your patience. Steven Stiggers, who is the executive director of EuroCLIO, which is the European Association of History Educators, which is one of the organizations who's uh, focused who is most focused on uh, historical, the transmission of uh, historical knowledge to address uh, present issues. Steven, the floor is yours. So I'm working for EuroCLIO, the European Association of History Educators. Um, it's, a, it's a big community, so we have educators from all over Europe. We actually have members from, uh, from all the EU member states, um, but also beyond. And um, yeah, what we do is we uh, organize training, we develop educational materials, uh, we do research, we do advocacy. And what I always find nice is that people are really like passionate. I say I always work with like the lucky teachers because they are going above and beyond uh, like later uh, to, to spend in the weekend to, uh, to exchange experiences. And I think what drives them is the potential of history education. Because, I mean, it can be taught in a way that is quite boring. Like just the facts, the names, memorialization. But it can also be a wonderful subject when it's really about asking critical questions, when students are challenged to do their own research, when they have to form their own opinions. Um, and ultimately, they also then recognize misuses of history, uh, resist manipulation. So if you look at the world where there's fragility of democracy, where uh, there's also a lot of apathy, actually, people are, who are not caring, or disinformation, stereotypes, I think all of these things, you can look back at history and see what kind of world do we want to have in the future. Um, so how to achieve that? But then you need to have education that's active and fun. 
inquiry based so that you have like questions that students also become curious. I think the best museum visits, for example, are the ones where you walk away with questions rather than just you say, okay, I now really know everything. Um, it should be experiential because we know that then you really remember um, and empowering for students. So how does that look like? So that also means that act students become active producers of history. So this is one uh, peer learning tutorial where students are actually making their own stories and are sharing. And here you can see that people are really working with, for example, professional cameras. This is somebody who's doing uh, like uh, work that she likes. Um, and we have amazing educators in our network who do, do, do this. And I just selected, but I wanted to show the, the, the people behind the network. And this is global, but I could put, of course, many, many more. So I wanted now to jump into the topic of this conference, which was about the victim databases. So I, I think as a history educator representative, I wanted to show about the educational potential. And the first thing that I thought about these databases is also, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. Um, do people, does anyone know where this photo is from? From Auschwitz. It's from Auschwitz, exactly. I was looking for an image to sort of say, okay, what represent these millions of victims who in a way are, to an extent, nameless. Um, and you have that also with some memorials, like the memorial of all the names. Uh, I also went to the Vietnam Memorial, for example, in the, in the US. We now have in the Netherlands the names Holocaust Memorial, and these are uh, the numbers that basically were put like uh, on the tattoos from the Holocaust. But behind those numbers, behind those names, there are always the personal stories. And I think that's also a hook to get people interested. It's about keeping the memory alive and to make it more tangible, because I think that is a major challenge, especially the, fa the victims who don't have like the relatives, who really are at the risk of being forgotten, who are perhaps not representative of the main victim groups. How do you like remember them? And th this is one of the examples, the stumbling stones. I think many of you will be familiar, but of course that this puts makes it very tangible. There were people who lived here in this place. And the case study that we have here is from a contested histories project. We've been mapping contested histories all over the world. We now have more than 500 cases. And for more or less 100, we've already identified, okay, what was the contestation about? So if you look at contestedhistories.org, then you can find them and you can see that people disagree about these contested histories. And even the stumbling blocks are actually contested because some people say, I don't want this in front of my house because I will be reminded every day what happened here, that there was a family who like, was deported and who died. Um, and there, of course, it raises also interesting debates because it's very often mentioned as a very good example, but we also have to respect the, the homes of the people and, I mean, those views. But how do you then do that? Because on the one hand, it needs to be a dialogue very often. I think you can only do it with permission of the people who live there. Um, and some other difficult questions, such as, do you have the right to commemorate? These were uh, some real dilemmas that we had in Buchenwald Memorial. Uh, we had the pleasure of, that was actually the first project we did with uh, the Europe for Citizens Remembrance Program. Um, like Otto Koch, he was the mayor of Weimar during the Nazi times. And he became a victim later when the camp was used uh, under, the, under the communist regime. And the family members of Otto Koch said, okay, we want to have a private commemoration for him because he was our father and we loved him, but he was also a Nazi perpetrator. In a way, you can't be the mayor of Weimar and not be complicit in the crimes that were committed. So what do you then do? Are you allowing a memorial? How big should it be? You have these sort of the private commemoration and you have the official commemoration. That's very complex. So what we usually do with EuroCleo is we turn that into a question. We don't say, okay, well, 
we thought deeply about it and now we know it and your students are going to learn. Now actually put the dilemma in the shoes of the, of the students. The example that you can see uh, on the other hand is like uh, the, uh, how do you name that? It's a, um, a ribbon, it's a ribbon. And that was actually from um, the granddaughter of another like official who basically said, found out that her grandfather committed a lot of crimes. And she, she said, okay, I miss you as a grandfather because you were lovely for me as a grandfather. But knowing now, I wish you had done some things differently. So I think things like this show the complexity. It, it brings in the humanity. And I think those are very powerful tools. In the end, to enable students to think about these complex issues. Uh, when it's about empowering, uh, and also giving a face. I think this is uh, an excellent example. There were some students uh, who were actually going to the war graves and we would adopt some of the graves to give them a face, to do research, to find out who are the people. So that so you take them out of anonymity. And any memorial that has names or numbers or any database, you can actually replicate that. And in this case, they presented their research findings. It was published in the local newspaper. So you can also see what we do is connected with the real world and people are interested in it. So you can publish. I think it's a real empowering story. Um, one example was a workshop that I had 10 years ago uh, at the Poland Museum. Uh, it was by, uh, a learning resource developed by the Falstadt Center and the Jewish Museum. Um, and what they did was actually to trace back the story of one person. And they combined all the archival footage from different places. And that's also what you can do with these victim databases. If you have the name, one archive is very often not enough, especially if people moved from like across Europe. And there you have some wonderful transnational stories where you can also say, because people do move and then you go from one place to another, from one archive to another. And they actually were challenged to combine all of this footage, some research questions, and then they would uh, present this in a blog post. But I think the methodology is quite good. What we're doing now ourselves is uh, we do a project with the Max Mannheimer Study Center. Uh, we have a project with one inquiry questions. Who were the victims of the National Socialists? in the past, but also in the present. And OK, of course, there were Jewish people, but there were also Roma and Sinti. There were also people. Actually, we now have like 20 page, 21 pagers with the different victim groups. So it is actually an impossible question to answer. And even if you think about like the people, for example, who were now not born, and if you think about all the, there's a lot. But the beautiful thing is, this is always in the curriculum. And there's always something that you can search, research locally. And in this case, I don't have the time now to show it, but they created peer learning tutorials where they can look at each other and say, learn not from the teachers, but actually learn from students in other countries to find out what they did. To go to the archives, to go to the museum, and also how they shared uh, the material. So, I promise to stick to 10 minutes, so I will stop my presentation here. But it gives just some ideas about uh, the victim databases. I think in the end, the key is find out where the stories are and let students do their own research. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for your does it work? Thank you for your um, enlightening presentation and, and brief uh, at the same time.